God bless you all, both here and online. God bless you. Let's welcome, let's acknowledge the one who blesses us all here today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the greatness of your love because you're a faithful father and your love never ceases. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, just as you walked on that road to Emmaus and opened up the word of God to those disciples and they were able to see things that they've not seen before, Lord Jesus, walk with us today, speak with us so that we might be able to see the things that you want us to see, even if we haven't seen them before. And Holy Spirit, just as those disciples that were with Jesus had their hearts burning within them, and then when they came to that table, their eyes were open. Holy Spirit, you opened their eyes to see that it was Jesus. Holy Spirit, be present today. Open our eyes to see Jesus. We come, we acknowledge that this is your house. We acknowledge that you want to walk with us. Reveal yourself to us afresh, we ask. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, God bless you all. I had a a whole introduction, but the Lord changed it because we just sang sang a song, which was get ready. And what are we supposed to get ready for? The king... Is coming. Amen? How about you tell the person next to you, the king is coming. (laughs) Amen? And and that just brought to mind, yesterday my wife and I went to our, our middle daughter's house because she's selling it. And we went to the house and we built a garden and we put some flowers in and we did all these things outside. Now they've they built this house, they've lived in it for, for many years, but they'd never really finished the garden. So now that they're going to sell it, have a guess what happened? <laughs> Mum and Dad came round and finished the garden. <laughs> and you know, it's the same in the kingdom. The king is coming. We need to get ready. And part of what I'm sharing this morning is something that's been on the Lord's heart right from day dot. It was there, very much integral in the heart of Jesus, yet hasn't been fully recognised in the world today. So with Jesus coming, have a guess what? We've got to get ready. We've got to get ready. And so we're going to be explore. and I'm just taking a beginning journey today. There's much more in it, but we're going to take just one little step in an understanding of what the Lord is doing to get, get the whole world ready, to get ready. ready. Two weeks ago, Pastor Dan was preaching about the good shepherd. That good shepherd who has a hundred sheep, but one is lost. And so what does this good shepherd do? He goes out looking for the lost one, the one that's lost. Actually, that, that scripture is in Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, the, the, the lost shepherd looking for the lost sheep is the first of three stories that Jesus told. The next story was about a woman who lost her coins, or one of her coins. She had 10, she lost one, and she searched everywhere until she found it. The last story is a story about a father who'd lost a son. His son, youngest son had taken the inheritance and gone away and he'd lost a son. But that's actually a story about two lost sons. But you, did you notice in those three stories, first the shepherd, then the mother looking for the coin and then the father looking for his son, so it's, there's a picture of the Trinity there? The shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd. We're going to look at more of that this morning. The woman, now the, the Holy Spirit is... <laughs> Is, is the Holy Spirit. He's not, it's spirit, it's not male or female always. But here, this, this mother is, is representing the Holy Spirit. And then the father who loves the son. We picked that picture? That's wonderful. In those stories, there's also four different types of lost that are being searched for. The first is the sheep who are part of the, of the flock and they're lost. Now, they know they're part of the flock And they know that they're lost, but they don't know how to get from being lost to being found. And so what just happens? The good shepherd goes out to rescue that sheep and bring it in. The second story of lostness, does a coin know it's lost? No. (laughs) 
totally oblivious and coined it. But still, God is looking for that lost. In the last story of lostness, it starts with the youngest son who takes his inheritance, goes and wastes it all. And, and then finally, when he's a pig pen, he says, I do not deserve my father's love, but I'm at least better there. So I'm going back. So he, he, he didn't even believe he deserved to be with the father. But that wasn't the heart, fa- father's, father's heart, was it? The father welcomed him. And blessed him. And then threw a great feast to say, my lost son is now welcomed. And in all those stories, the the shepherd, when he brings the sheep in, there's great rejoicing because the lost sheep is found. For the woman who found the coin, there's great rejoicing because that coin that was lost is now found. And for the father who had that prodigal son that was lost, when he comes back, he throws a great feast because the lost one was found. But you didn't know in those stories there's a fourth Picture of lostness. Because that father had a younger son who was lost and is now found, but he also had an older son, his firstborn son. And he was lost too. He'd he'd been with the father, but he he never knew the father's heart. And when the father's throwing a party for the son, he's not interested at all. And so the story of lostness ends with the father, and I've got a picture there. Well, it's not of the real thing, but it's a representation of it. Of the father outside, and the father is, is, is taking time with the firstborn son to, to plead with the firstborn son to understand his father's heart, both for the lost one who is throwing a for, but also for the firstborn son who's never really Got it. Now that's where the story ends. So we've got three that are great rejoicing, they're found and everyone's celebrating and we've got this one son who at the end of the stories that Jesus stopped is still lost. I believe that's a prophetic picture of these last days of what the Spirit of God is doing to get ready for the coming King. Because this is a picture of the God's firstborn son, Israel. And so to look at this further, we, and, and Jesus was greatly prophetic in all the things that he shared. Have you picked that up? Right at the beginning of his ministry, he, his first disciples were coming to him. One was Nathaniel and he speaks to Nathaniel. And he says something about Nathaniel, and Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And he says, oh, even before you came, even before you got the invitation to come and see me, I saw you sitting under a fig tree. Wow. So Jesus had these visions. Jesus had words of knowledge. The Samaritan woman, he was able to say, oh, well, you've (laughs) had a few husbands, and the guy you're with now, he's not your husband. Wow. Jesus was very prophetic. He spoke many things, that, some that happened in his, his lifetime. He, he prophesied he was going to bring Lazarus back from the dead, and that's what he did. Some of them happened after he died. He prophesied that the temple would be destroyed, 70 AD. Decades after Jesus died, that happened. He prophesied that Israel would be taken out of the land. In the, uh, AD 120, the, the Romans came down, took all the, the Jews out of the land and sold of the land and said, no. Nah, This doesn't belong to Jews anymore, and they named it Palestine. God also, Jesus also did many prophetic acts. His baptism was a prophetic act. He he was baptized. Now, what does baptize represent? Baptize represents being buried in the water and coming alive again. Well, Jesus was baptized as a prophetic act that looked towards his death and resurrection. And after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. A prophetic act talking about Pentecost. Jesus had a number of other prophetic acts. Went up onto the mountain and he met with Moses and Elijah. And we, if you read through Revelation 11, there's two witnesses and they come in the picture of Moses and Elijah. He was talking about the end times and in many of his parables, he talked about the end times. The whole of uh, Matthew 24 and 25 is about getting ready for the coming king. 
Jesus also had the prophetic act of cursing the fig tree, which represents Israel, because it didn't produce fruit. But then and he does that in Matthew 21, and then Matthew 24, he says, if you want to know what, when it's time to get ready, watch the fig tree, which is a picture, leaves on the fig tree, which is watch Israel. So Israel is a key picture for this coming in, as Paul said in, in Romans 11. If their rejection meant the gospel went to all the world, wow, that's a great blessing. Are you blessed by that? Amen. He said, what will their acceptance mean? Whoa, life from the dead. Life from the dead. So let's come to the scriptures now, and we're going to see Jesus talking about himself as the good shepherd. We're going to read from John's Gospel, chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as a father knows me and knows a father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus says, I'm the good sheep, shepherd. What does a good shepherd do? When the, when the enemy comes, does he run away? No, he stands before and he's even willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And Jesus is here being, he's being prophetic, isn't he? I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. But I want you to have a look at this passage. And the first things he says is, I lay down my life for the sheep. In a minute, he's going to talk about another flock. I have sheep not of this, <laughs> not of this sheep pen. So he's... When he's talking about sheep, not of this sheep pen, who's he talking about? Us. So when he's originally talking, who's he talking about? When he talks, I will lay down my life on my sheep, who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. When Jesus was crucified, what did Pilate write on the cross? Jesus, King of the Jews. In Latin, Aramaic and Hebrew. You see, when Jesus died, how would he, he died as the Messiah of the Jews. He died for his sheep, Israel. Now, most, now, now all the apostles at the, at the beginning, they were all Jewish and they went out and they took the gospel to all the world. But the majority of Israel rejected and the leaders rejected their Messiah. But Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep. If you have a look in um, one of the theme verses, passages for hope is Matthew 10, where Jesus came and he commended his disciples. And he asked, and, and this, is what he, this is what he said to them. It's in Matthew chapter 10. He says, when he was commissioning the disciples to go out and minister, he says, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. We, we often forget Jesus spent all his ministry time ministering to the lost of Israel. When I, was a, when I went to school, high school, I went to an Anglican school. And we had a, we had a um, hymn that was a school hymn. And I was in the choir, I even sang it. It was a beautiful tune. It said, did he in ancient of days walk upon England's mountains green? No, he didn't. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> no way. Jesus spent all of his ministry time in a little area, in the, in the area of Galilee and in the Jezreel Valley, with an occasional trip, as a Jew was meant to do, down to Jerusalem to minister there. We have a few stories where he 
on his way back, he, he did some ministry in a Samaritan village and that was a one-off. And a few other places. But that's Jesus spent. He only had a few, he only, from the time he was baptised to his died, he only had a bit over three and a half years. And what did he spend in that time? He'd spent all of that time ministering to the lost of Israel. Do you think that was, did you think that meant something to him then? Absolutely. If we're going to love Jesus, do you think he still has that heart? And for thousands of years, we as a church have lost it. And I believe as we're getting ready, <laughs> the garden needs to be finished. The garden needs to be finished. Jesus then goes on. And he says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Jesus, in his ministry, spent all the time with the Jews. But did he know it was going to go to the world? Yes, he did. When he came to Nazareth, his own town, <laughs> said a prophet's not welcome in his own town, and they did reject him and sought to put him to death. And in a prophetic act, he showed that the Jews were going to reject him and he was going to die and then walk away alive. He walked, <laughs> as they tried to kill him, he walked out. A prophetic act once again, displaying the cross, the death and the resurrection. But when he spoke to them, he said, in, he spoke to them two, two words in that message as well as saying that he was fulfilling Isaiah 60. He talked about Elijah who went to Zarephath. He said there was many widows in Israel, <laughs> but Elijah went to the Gentiles. And then he said, and Naaman, there was many lepers in Elisha's time, but it was Naaman, <laughs> the Gentile leper, that was healed. Jesus was prophetically once again picturing. He knew the gospel would go out to the nations. And in this passage here, talking about the good shepherd, he's talking about the sheep at the other pen. He's talking about church Israel. The gospel is going to go out to the nations. Jesus knew it. He understood it. He spoke of it. Just a little aside here, it says, and they too will know my voice. They too will listen to my voice. We're meant to hear and obey the Lord's word, aren't we? By the way, if I can put a little plug here, in on the 16th of October, we have a prophetic school. And what that's really doing is trying to encourage people to step into the fullness of who, what our inheritance is, is in Jesus. And he said it earlier. He said, my sheep know my voice. And then they listen to it. Well, if you want to know more about knowing the voice of Jesus, listening to it, prophetic school coming. You need to be there. Amen. I was talking to someone just before the service. Um, lovely lady. She dances around at the beginning of the service. Have you, have you noticed that? I was speaking to her and the, the other week she was dancing around. I went up and just spoke and I said, I saw these angels, worship angels following you. And they said, they're lovely and they, what you did, they did. And they're just doing this over the church. I said, wow, that's nice. <laughs> and she said, God told me to dance. And she said, do what God tells you to do. See, she already had the message. <laughs> she already had the message. Jesus then goes on to say, I must bring them also. So what he's talking about is I must bring the Gentiles, the sheep of the other pen, and then they will come and join in with what? The first flock. And then what does he say? And then there will be one flock and one Lord. You know, in, in church history, at first it started with, they were all Jewish. All the apostles, they were Jewish. Day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, poured out with power. And it was all Jewish people gathered for the... Feast of Pentecost that received the Holy Spirit on that day. And if we look through the scriptures, then it, after then, it, Jesus had said, it'll be starting Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And if we follow through the, the scripture period, we, we 
uh, the, the biblical record, we see that it explains how that began to happen. But this is Jesus saying, but at the end, and this is, I, I believe Jesus is being perfect, at the end of the age, getting ready for the kingdom to come, Jesus is going to bring the Gentiles, the sheep of the other pen, and it, where's he going to do? He's going to bring them to the first flock, and then there will be one Lord and one kingdom. You know, when that, that, that gospel journey as it went out and, and the Jews weren't believing, the, the, the apostles and, and Paul went to the, uh, to the Jews too and, and there was a number of Jews that believed, but eventually there was very, virtually no Jewish believers. And the church said, we don't need them anymore and they kept on going. And the church began to split. You had Catholics and Orthodox and you know, as we follow church history down, it's, it's, it's kept on splitting and splitting. Which, you know, the, the, there was a, the, the Catholic church and the split and the Protestants and, and, you know, and the evangelicals and the charismatics. and that, that, Whichever, look, it's, I think in, in South Korea alone, there's about 110 Presbyterian denominations. We're pretty good at splitting, aren't we? But Jesus is here talking about unity. And there shall be one Lord and one flock. Jesus prayed, John 15, Lord, I pray, I pray that they might be one, even as you and I are one. And I believe a secret weapon the Lord has kept for these last days is to bring the sheep from the other pen, to join with the first flock, and then there will be one body. I believe that the key to unity amongst the body of Christ right throughout the world is to recapture that heart for Israel. To recapture that heart for Israel. I'd like to refer now to one of the other scriptures, key scriptures for hope. And it's from Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 talks about the prophet Ezekiel and he has this vision. And in this vision, he sees this whole valley of dry bones. They're dead, they're gone, they're nothing. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and says, can these live? And, and I'm sure we all put up here. I know what I'd say, but I love the wisdom that this prophet Ezekiel says. <clears throat> Only you know, Lord. <laughs> and then Ezekiel has to prophesy, and he prophesies to the bones. And what happens to happen? These bones start to rattle. And they start to rattle and, 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 and come together. And then flesh appears. Until finally this whole body's there, flesh, skin, eyes, everything. But it's still dead. <laughs> this is the prophecy of what God has done with Israel. They were taken out of the land. Thousands of years, even the rabbis, the, chief, the chiefs among them, we can never go back to Israel, we've been away too long. We've lost the land. <laughs> God knew better. And we've seen in our, our generation, Israel come back. To, and there is now an Israel. The Jews are living in the land. Man. And the, the, there is a messianic body that start to grow up. Yes, there is. But the majority of Israel have a guess what? They're still dead. God has brought them back together. But I've got the scripture here. This is what the Lord then says to Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, you've got to prophesy again. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into, the, into these slain that they may live. Ezekiel didn't 
prophesy to the breath, oh, just come, the breath being the spirit of the living God, come into this dead body and make it alive again. He had to prophesy to the breath to come. Where from? The four winds, which is really the four corners of the earth. This is to come where? From the sheep, not of the other pen, the Holy Spirit, to come from this other pen that the Lord has poured out his Holy Spirit and to come into and minister this breath of God into Israel, into the firstborn son that they might live. I believe that's a commission for these days in which we're now living. And I believe as a church of God, we've got to pick it up. Now, what does that mean for us? I haven't, <laughs> I know, I mean, that's a big question and we, we haven't even begun to start that question. But I'd like to take us a first step today. I'm going to invite the band if they'd like to come back and join us now. And I've got one more scripture and it's Acts chapter 1. Jesus resurrected. He'd, he, he'd taken time with the disciples and now he was, he, he was about to ascend into heaven. And the disciples came to him and they said, are you going to restore to the, the kingdom to Israel at this time? And Jesus answered, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority. Jesus was complimenting their question. He's saying, that's going to happen. But it's not for you to know the times when that's going to happen. He then goes on, wait for me in Jerusalem and you, uh, until you receive power from on high and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So once it gets out to the four winds, have a guess what? It's now time to come back. Mark just brought me this. and uh, Let me explain what this is. This was made by a Mongolian Christian who came to Jerusalem in 2017 at the invitation of the Messianic body, which is the, the Israel believers who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And in 2017, there was again, they invited the nations to join with them in welcoming Jesus as a King of glory into Jerusalem. And in Chinese and English, it's got written, Ephesians chapter 2, one new man, Jew and Gentile together. Now notice it's got, it, it, it starts, the breath comes in here. I want you to see that as a breath of God. And it finds two expression, two sheep pens, one Jewish and one Gentile. But what comes out is one voice. We sang that earlier tonight, earlier this morning, didn't we? One voice, one song, what, what? Singing hallelujah. Praise God. So I'm going to blow this horn. And as I blow this horn, I want you to ask for the, for the Lord to, to bring into your heart that love of the Father for the firstborn son. We're meant to get it in these days. We're meant to receive. And this is the first step to receive the Father's heart of love. Jesus had it. He spent all his time ministering to the lost of Israel. The father's out there with the firstborn son. At the end of the story, he's not found. The father's still saying, come, my son, come, my son. And as I blow this horn this morning, could you ask the Lord, if, if, if the Lord's spoken to you, could you ask the Lord, Lord, give me that love. It's your love. Let your love become my love. And whatever that means, let it be so for this hour and now. Let's stand. We're going to sing and I'm going to blow this trumpet and then I'm going to invite us to be led to finish.